Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Moving the Needle on Six Powerful ROI Benefits of E-Procurement Integration. I'm Mark Brohan, Senior Vice President of B2B and Market Research for Digital Commerce 360, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. We have a really great slate of content planned for the session, and we hope you get a lot out of it because we're going to tell you all about moving the needle on e-procurement and ROI. So 80% of B2B sales interactions will occur digitally, but in an increasingly crowded B2B e-commerce space, leading organizations of any size are exploring ways to remain competitive and grow revenue from digital channels. One key strategy is accommodating sophisticated buyer requirements for an integrated purchasing experience. I'm gonna emphasize that. Another word for that is called omnichannel. So our content today uh, explores a study commissioned by TradeCentric on the key components used to evaluate and measure the business impact of B2B connected commerce solutions. And with this, I'm pleased to join our panelists today, Jamie Axelrod, partner, Hobson & Company, and Tom Roberts, CMO of TradeCentric. Um, so before we get going here, I'm going to maybe talk just a little bit about why e-procurement is no longer just, um, it, why B2B e-commerce and why e-procurement are now digital mainstream and not, as some folks might still think, a minor sales channel. It's far from the opposite. So my first slide, please. To put into perspective how important e-procurement is today, you need to kind of look at the big picture. I like to kind of tell people with our research here that to understand the micro, in other words, what does e-procurement mean to me, regardless of my size as a B2B organization, it's, it's important to know the macro so you can figure out what the micro is for you. So my first takeaway here is that this year, last year, overall has been a pretty good manufacturing run and distribution run for growth overall. So altogether, manufacturing and, and uh, distribution sales together accounted for about $13 trillion. In perspective, that's over half of the nation's gross domestic products. That's the size of what we're talking about here. That's the entire pool of everything that manufacturers make and B2B distribution companies sell. But that's the big picture. So keep in mind that 13 trillion. Now, next slide, please. We're gonna whittle that down a little bit. So if you look at what role does B2B e-commerce play in that $13 trillion all-in number, that was the size of manufacturing and distribution, then last year, 1.635 trillion. That's not billion, not million, that's trillion with a T. And the key takeaway here is not only is that channel growing twice as fast as overall sales in some vertical markets, it's also going faster overall than total manufacturing distribution sales. But my takeaway here is that yes, we're used to e-commerce and on the B2B side being a fast growing channel. It's, it's been that way for quite some time. But I think my biggest takeaway here is look at the percentage that B2B sales now incorporate of the total pie, nearly 15%. That 15% is a takeaway that this is no longer just minor, nice to have, a nice channel for some people. What this tells you is this is mainstream business now going online and never coming back. And now, so we've taken one number, 13 trillion, that's growing 15%. Our B2B e-commerce number from last year was growing 18%, but the takeaway here is that 15% of those sales are all online e-commerce. But now let's kind of go to my, my, my final slide here. Here's, 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 here's the takeaway. Here's the key takeaway to kind of set the stage for what, what we're gonna talk about next year, which is e-procurement is now becoming a mainstream digital business channel. So yeah, I mean, uh, two things changed that. Of course, you know, COVID turned everything on its ear. And what emerged from that three years ago was a digital first B2B buyer that when their traditional channels shut down, what they did was they took to online and finding new and new and better sources to find whatever they could to get through the crisis. Well, yeah, old news, been there, done that. But the takeaway here is that now 
that digital first buyer is now mainstream e-commerce. And one of the ways that they're going to do more business online now and going forward is e-procurement. So you can't think of e-procurement as a minor sales channel, just the opposite. This is approaching a trillion dollar market. So keep in mind, 17, you know, 13.6 trillion overall, 1.6 trillion coming in there for all B2B sales, if you will, electronic sales, and then look at what Punch-Out is doing. So 8.5% of all that pie for e-commerce is being driven through procurement, e-procurement, and more importantly, 7% of the total pie of that 17, of that 13.6 trillion is now coming from e-procurement. So this is not just a one-hit wonder sales channel. This is what is becoming mainstream because the experience that digital first buyers want is they look at many channels and the fastest growing channel that we looked at in 2021 outside of B2B marketplaces was e-procurement. So that is to kind of set the stage for why e-procurement is mainstream, why it's coming on fast, we'll do nothing but grow. But now let's set the perspective for how we generate some ROI and what that means to a totally connected B2B e-commerce buyer. So with that, I'm gonna to introduce uh, Tom Roberts from, uh, from Trade Centric and Tom, please take it away. Thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for attending today. Um, so I'm Tom Roberts, as Mark mentioned earlier, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Trade Centric. Um, many of you I know have you know, read uh, Digital Commerce 360 for years. You may know us as Punch Out To Go. Uh, company's been around for more than a decade, but this summer we changed our name from Punch Out To Go to Trade Centric. And why did we do that? Um, Really the core and this first thing here, just a quick overview of us is that we do much more than punch out. We also do PO and invoice automation, as well as a number of other things that sort of help automate that process that Mark was talking about in terms of commerce. So punch out is one leg of this of the stool, but then there are others. In terms of who we are, in terms of numbers, 100 billion transaction through our platform, which is punch out plus PO, et cetera, 15,000 supported customer integrations, um, more than 3,200 companies overall in our network. And then we support, and this is key, to make all this work, connections to more than 75 e-commerce solutions and 150 plus e-procurement -pro e solutions. Uh, we do operate globally, um, headquartered in Charlottesville, Virginia, but operate um, across Europe and parts of APAC. And you can see some of our customers um, down below. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. So just to sort of build on um, some of our statistics, and the last one on the right there is directly from Mark and Digital Commerce 360, but the first is really a, a McKinsey survey about B2B buying and um, how really people think about buying. And overall, 94% um, believe that there'll be B2B omni-channel purchasing that stretches long before um, the pandemic happened and long after the pandemic is done, which will hopefully be done with certainly soon. The second stat, 80% by 2025 is really from Gardner and that's B2B sales interactions between buyers and suppliers occurring through digital channels, just building on what Mark said about sort of the overall growth of B2B e-commerce is becoming the predominant purchasing channel overall. And then finally, uh, Mark's own numbers looked at in a different way in a quick bar chart about the power of e-procurement and the, the importance of the e-procurement channel to suppliers and its growth between 2020 and 2021. And as Mark mentioned, um, according to their own uh, forecast, that'll be north of a trillion dollars here shortly in 2022 or 2023. So very much pertinent to the overall concept of what we're talking today in terms of connected commerce. And with that, I just wanna set the stage on what we mean by connected commerce and then sort of set up the study that We'll go into in a second about what that looks like. So the next slide. So connected commerce really starts with um, either buyers or suppliers. Suppliers here on the right hand side, audience today, with a, a profusion of different commerce platforms to choose from, um, including still some custom platforms, but the ability to allow those buyers who are implementing Coupa, Jagger, uh, SAP Ariba, iValua, Oracle, et cetera, to actually use their e-commerce platforms as their preferred purchasing platform, but to do that connecting with your e-commerce platforms 
in an integrated, seamless and secure way, but then also be able to harness the power of both e-commerce and any procurement to drive um, compliant spends and transparent spends, but then do it using the commerce platforms that you all are investing substantial sums in. In addition to sort of that punch out capability, it's the ability to sort of support other automations around the transaction. So purchase orders, invoices, purchase order acknowledgements, uh, shipping uh, notifications, et cetera. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about truly connected commerce between sophisticated B2B buyers and their uh, increasingly sophisticated suppliers. So with that, um, next slide. I'm really gonna turn it over to Jamie here, who is the, the star of the show. We hired um, Hobson and Company, and she'll, she'll sort of do a, a deeper introduction to Hobson and Company um, early last, early this year to really undertake a study as an independent expert third party to really talk to our supplier community and try and understand the value that they were, they were getting from their connected commerce solutions in support of their buyers, both in terms of additional uh, revenue growth, as well as sort of internal um, organizational efficiencies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Axra to go through the study and its results. And again, it's an independent study by experts, Hobson and Company. So Jamie, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for being on the call today. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm a partner at Hobson and Company. Um, I've been with Hobson for about 20 years, um, focusing on creating return on investment and total cost of ownership models for enterprise software companies. So what is Hobson? So we are a independent third-party consulting firm, as Tom mentioned, and we work with these enterprise technology companies to help them uncover, quantify, and validate their key sources of value that drive the adoption of this new and emerging technology. Um, so, so how do we do this? Well, we are a firm that has over 20 years experience. Um, you can see we've worked with a number of different industries, a number of different size clients from startups to more established. And the whole idea is to help these, our clients, our clients understand what is the value that their customers are seeing from using their software? And we do this through a series of interviews with our clients' customers. And so for this study, um, TradeCentric um, commissioned Hobson, as Tom mentioned, to work with them to help uncover what their key sources of value were for their customers. Um, and we have a very standard process for doing this. So at the outset, what we do is we identify customers that um, are important from a multiple range of different um, industries for me to speak with. So for the Trade Centric project, I spoke with over a dozen of Trade Centric's customers, um, and these were in-depth, one-on-one interviews to understand what life was like before using Trade Centric and what life is like after using Trade Centric. And how can we potentially quantify those benefits in terms of cost savings to the organization, any type of productivity improvements to the organization, and any type of revenue implications? These interviews, as I mentioned, were conducted one-on-one. -on -one. It was me and TradeCentric's customer. That was it. Um, so we were able to get a lot of really great, candid responses. Um, we also assured the customers that their names and their organization would not be mentioned, mm -hmm. so any data that they provided would be completely anonymous. Through these interviews, we were able to uncover six big benefits that were universally supported from all of the customers, and we were able to quantify those benefits. We were able to quantify those benefits through pre- and post-implementation anecdotes. In the end, we took those six quantifiable benefits that were universally supported by all of the customers and we created a return on investment calculator. This is a web-based customized business case analysis that TradeCentric can now use with new prospects to help 
illustrate the potential magnitude of the benefits of working with TradeCentric based on what other customers have seen. So throughout the interviews, it really became clear that there were certain pains that a connected commerce solution like TradeCentric could help solve. And these pains fell, these benefits fell into two big categories, two big value drivers. The first being increased operational efficiencies, and the second big value driver was revenue growth. For the increased operational efficiency benefits, again, these were the ones that came to the top throughout all of the interviews. Um, what we really learned is that there is um, a big benefit um, with time savings, time savings to set up and maintain integrations um, via routes, as well as time savings managing purchase orders and invoicing. Again, for this study, we focused on those three key products of TradeCentric that Tom mentioned, the punch out, purchase order, and invoice management. And we heard universally from TradeCentric customers that using TradeCentric could help reduce the administrative burden of those three groups, of the IT group, the accounts payable group, and the purchase order management group, could, using punch out, and the other two products could reduce the administrative burden so that these staff could be redeployed into more critical activities. We're gonna get into the specific benefits in just a moment. On the other hand, on the other side of the uh, benefits was this idea of improving revenue from using TradeCentric. And universally, what we heard time and time again from these customer interviews was that using TradeCentric allowed their customers to not only grow their existing customer base by offering a connected commerce solution, but they had the ability to attract new buyers as well as enter new markets. And we have really solid quantitative data points on how they were able to use TradeCentric to, to grow their business. So let me focus now on the specific benefits. As I mentioned, these are the top six benefits that were universally supported from all of the interviews. We were able to quantify these benefits in terms of cost savings, productivity impact, and revenue growth. So the first benefit I wanna talk about is on the left-hand side. This is under the increased operational efficiency big bucket. And this is the idea that there is, on average, customers saw a 60% reduction in the IT time to set up and manage their e-procurement integrations with buyers. We heard a lot about the challenges of setting up a new integration route, um, the time-consuming um, nature, how IT would have to recreate the wheel anytime a new buyer route was needed, there's also complications with validating and maintaining existing routes, especially if a buyer updated or changed their ERP system. Many of the customers I talked to just basically opted out of the connected commerce solution because they didn't have the time or the capacity to manage it in-house. Others chose to work with third parties and talked about the exorbitant price of paying a third party anytime a new integration was needed. All of the customers I talked to mentioned how using TradeCentric's cloud-based platform, as well as using their integration, their, their integration team, really resolved all of those challenges. The next benefit that we were able to quantify is that on average, customers saw at least an 80% reduction in time spent managing their purchase orders. I heard that with TradeCentric, the purchase order system is completely automated. What that means is that the customers, the suppliers were able to reduce the keying of orders, which also reduced, which also increased the accuracy of the data. The purchase order team only needed to work on exceptions or failures, and that really reduced the amount of time that they needed to spend working in the purchase order system. The last benefit in this productivity category is that we heard that customers saw at least a 75% reduction in time entering and correcting and integrating invoices. 
customers, you know, they were told us, the suppliers told us buyers no longer want paper or email invoices. As you heard, they want a fully integrated e-commerce solution. Um, the customers told me that manually entering the invoices was very time consuming, but now working with TradeCentric, they don't have to do the invoice matching. The invoice always matches the purchase order and the AP team can now focus on more critical activities. So those are the three big benefits that we heard from the customers that support the idea that using a connected commerce solution like TradeCentric saved the, the team time, right? That saved the IT folks time, saved the purchase order management team time, saved the accounts payable team time. All of those people could now work on more critical activities to the organization. At the same time, we heard universally from all of the customers that using TradeCentric helped them grow their business in a few different ways, help them increase their revenue. The first benefit was that we heard that there was at least a 20% increase in digital revenue from existing buyers. That's to say by now being able to offer the punch out solution to existing buyers, existing buyers are like, great, we wanna do more business with you. We heard that the, the, the buyer's procurement office said, hey, we want you to work with that supplier, that supplier that now has the punch out capabilities, because it is so much easier to do business with them, right? We can, we can be tied to the buyer's workflow approval system and be recommended because it's just that much easier. So because of that ease of integration, that ease of doing business with that supplier, the suppliers were able to grow their existing base from those, get more revenue from their existing buyers. Separately, the suppliers were able to enter new markets or attract new buyers. I heard from one customer who said, hey, we used to get RFPs and we couldn't respond when they asked what our punch out capabilities were. Now we're, quote, we're in the game. We can answer all of the RFPs and we've been able to enter new markets. So again, that was an additional 20% of digital revenue by attracting new buyers and being able to enter new markets. And finally, the last benefit um, that impacts revenue is we heard that on average, there was at least a 5% reduction in days in accounts receivable. The reason being is that the invoices are cleaner when they're sent the first time. There's a reduction in disputes, there's a reduction in errors, and because the invoices get sent out so much faster and they're cleaner, the suppliers are getting paid faster. Getting paid faster means more revenue faster. Ultimately, that is a big deal for these suppliers. So those are the six benefits that we were able to quantify through the discussions with the trade centric customers. And what I'd like to do now is go through a case study. Actually, before I do that, I want to give you just some very firsthand feedback on what we heard from customers. And these are just two representative quotes. Um, I wanted to give the, the direct quotes so that you can see um, what we heard from the customers. Um, the first is, there is a natural organic growth when we use Punch Out. It improves the way we present our products, makes it easier for customers to find what they need, as well as fine related products. Carts tend to grow with punch out. So this is from the director of e-commerce engineering at a leading lab equipment and software provider. The next representative quote is, using a connected commerce is huge. The whole invoice process now saves time for both our AR team as well as our customers. The invoices always match the purchase orders. And this is from a program manager at a major global manufacturer. Now I'm gonna go through a case study. So as I mentioned, the, the end deliverable for Hobson to, to give to TradeCentric is an ROI calculator. It's a web-based ROI calculator that is completely customizable to a given prospect's business case. But before we finalize this model, I'd like to show it to a few customers to make sure it makes sense. And so what I'm going to show you right now is an example of walking through this calculator with an actual trade-centric customer. 
The goals of this customer before they started using Trade Centric were twofold. One was to build their business to business by accelerating growth with their existing customers and attracting new customers. And the second was to improve their operational efficiencies. They knew that they were just spending way too much time managing their purchase orders and invoices. So they worked with TradeCentric. They are using their punch out, their purchase order and their invoice solutions. And what we did, what I did with this customer is I said, let's, let's look at the actual calculator and see if it makes sense. Let's see if it illustrates the actual benefit that you're getting from using TradeCentric. So for this particular customer, you can see on the right-hand side what the assumptions are that we used. This customer had 20 routes before they started using TradeCentric, right when they started, and now they've subsequently grown. At the time when they first started working with TradeCentric, they were getting about 40 purchase orders and sending 40 invoices per day. They had about a million dollars of annual revenue that had the potential to be integrated. And for them, what the price tag for TradeCentric is about $41,000 a year. So I show this to you um, so that you can envision, you know, how this company, you know, what the background is of this company, but to also say that in any, in every case with this ROI calculator, it can be customized to whatever the customers, the prospects situation is, right? Whatever your company situation looks like, it can be tailored to that. Some benefits can be turned off if needed. You can make adjustments to the assumptions, but these are the assumptions that we're using for this discussion. So after going through and putting in this customer's data, we came out with an ROI. In the next slide, I'm gonna show you the ROI, which you can see comes out to a three-year ROI of 750% and a four-month payback after go live. And I don't know about you, but I see 750% and I say, ooh, that seems pretty high. Um, and the customer agreed, they said, Let's, let's, let's dig into the numbers, 750% ROI seems rather large. Um, but what I wanna tell you is that once the customer and I, once we dug into the individual benefits and the individual contributions for each of those benefits, they basically agreed. They, they didn't basically, they did agree. And they said, yes, absolutely. These are the benefits that we're getting from Trade Centric. So let me highlight for you what those benefits are from a quantitative perspective. And you can see those on the right hand, bottom right hand side here. The first big benefit was attracting new buyers from using TradeCentric. And the five year contribution was about $780,000. And they said, yeah, absolutely. Over five years, we definitely had you know, much more than a million, a couple of million dollars in new revenue from using TradeCentric. So that number is very conservative. The same thing with the second benefit, growing their digital revenue from their existing buyers because now they're a preferred supplier. Again, this customer said, absolutely, we've definitely had over $780,000 worth of benefits. And then the next two benefits highlight the time savings, this productivity savings, from reducing time managing the purchase orders, as well as reducing time spent managing the invoices. And when you look at these numbers over five years, you can see it comes out to even less than one FTE over five years of time savings. Um, and this customer said, absolutely, we know that we have saved a significant amount of time in just this manual entering of invoicing, of purchase orders, the manual matching of the invoices, um, so the bottom line is that when you add up these four benefits and you look at what they're paying for trade centric, in the end, the customer said, absolutely, that 750% is actually realistic. So I throw that out to you just to, because I'm a math person and any of you who are on the call and we're doing the mental math in your head, um, just to show you that the calculation um, not only is valid, but also supported by the customer. The last thing I want to point out is that on the left-hand side, you can see that the benefits of using TradeCentric 
fall neatly into two big categories as we've been talking this whole, this whole discussion. About two thirds of the benefits of trade centric in this case help support that revenue growth, right? By attracting new buyers, as well as becoming the preferred supplier of the existing buyers. And a third of the benefits fall into that saving time, that improving our operational efficiencies. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom, um, who's gonna just talk about some of the resources that are available. Thanks so much, Jamie, for taking us through that. Um, I appreciate it. So um, a couple quick points um, here is that we do have some resources that anybody um, on the meeting or on the call today can take advantage of. There's a white paper that's up on the Trade Centric website um, that you can download. Um, that really was written by Hobson, not by Trade Centric. It's got a Trade Centric brand on it, but it was written independently by uh, by Hobson, which kind of takes you through this whole analysis in written form, um, and then also a similar case study that's laid out in the white paper. So if you'd like to download that or share that with anybody in your organization, uh, please feel free to get that off of our website. And then also, one of the outputs that we um, we have from Hobson is a custom ROI analysis ca calculator. It's a web-based calculator that takes what Jamie described and all the calculations and the inputs and is available as um, a web-based sort of calculator that we use with our subject matter experts and our customers or prospects to create a custom return on investment analysis for prospects and customers specific situation. Not all situations are the same. Jamie took you through a specific um, case study with the number of customers and the amount of um, revenue that could be integrated, et cetera. Everybody's different. So this allows us to tailor the analysis to very specific situations and then hand that analysis and walk, that anal walk uh, customers and prospects through that analysis and then hand that analysis over to them. If you would like a custom analysis, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to do that free of charge. I'm going to repeat that, free of charge. Um, and you can just reach out to us at that email address that's there called info at tradecentric.com. Just mention that you are on this webinar and that you would like a custom um, analysis and we will get one of our subject matter experts introduced to you and the process uh, started. So again, white paper up on our website, tradecentric.com as well as if you'd like a custom ROI analysis, we're happy to engage in that with you. And you can email us at info at TradeCentric. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Mark. And I think Mark is going to take us through um, a quick poll, and then we'll kind of move on to Q&A. Mark? Yep. Well, Tom, thank you, for, uh, thank you for that. And Jamie, excellent information. I always kind of like to kind of uh, put things into perspective as we kind of go through one of these uh, interactive sessions here. So. Just for those who are somewhat new to this channel and they're hearing a lot of information, Tom, could you just quickly define e-procurement as trade-centric season and then how you would define punch out for a typical organization? Sure. Um, so e-procurement, you know, it's really the procurement organization in a small, medium, or large enterprise investing in a software solution that really allows the head of procurement, CFO, procurement lieutenants, et cetera, to really get better visibility and better analytics around their spend. So common platforms that are, are, we're connected to and people use, Coupa, iValua, Jagger, very prevalent in the uh, college, university, and healthcare space, um, SAP, Ariba, et cetera. So people have been investing in those platforms for a good 20 odd years, but the growth of e-procurement overall investment is um, similar to things that you talked about, Mark, up and to the right. Um, punch out really is the ability for someone who's a purchaser and using a Coupa or whatever to basically be able to say, okay, I'm going to go to my supplier's website securely and authentically and authenticate into that website and basically shop just as if I would if I were natively logging in um, and fill up my cart. But instead of checking out and using a credit card, pull that cart contents back into the procurement solution rather than retyping it in, et cetera. And then that, that cart contents and what they want to purchase is um, routed for approval as you want to do if you're compliant. So that's really the, co the concept of e-procurement 
why people are investing in it and the concept of punch out and the leverage that both a selling organization and a purchase organization get from that. Does that make sense? It does, and thank you for that. And then uh, I wanna just kind of educate, you know, the, the folks that are looking at this webinar and then tuning in afterwards, which is my colleague Paul Demery and I, and we look at a lot of data kind of day in, day out. And there are a lot of application development companies that will come out with you know, various forms of analysis. And in many cases, it can be like a market basket, like a snapshot type of thing. What's entirely different about trade-centric, Tom, is that you have probably the most unique holistic view of an e-commerce channel of any company out there that I know of. Because why is that? You've got, I believe, what, 75 or pretty much all of the back of, of all the procurement software people coming through your pipelines. That gives you a unique, a unique perspective grounded in everybody kind of flowing through your pipeline to kind of look at the e-procurement channel. So uh, I find that very, very interesting about why this is a, a, an up and coming channel because it's not just a snapshot. When you got the whole pipeline coming here, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting, I think. So now for the folks at home here, as I like to, I like to say, Let's get you involved here. Let's do a quick poll and see what you, what's what's happening with you folks. Our poll, please. Okay. What is the biggest challenge your e-commerce organization is facing heading into 2023? Too much time integrating with buyers e-procurement systems. Too much time managing, rekeying and processing purchase orders and invoice. Difficulty responding to requests for hosted catalogs difficulty growing revenue from existing customers or waiting too long to get payment from customers so why don't you folks uh take a sec to vote here or a couple of seconds to vote here and then we're going to see how uh, how all the answers here stack up okay well, i think that's that's a, that's a a uh, fairly good window for folks to have kind of uh, voted their uh, their choices here. Let's look at our results. Okay, so the question once again was, what is the biggest challenge your e-commerce organization is facing heading into 2023? And the Whopper looks to be too much time integrating with buyers e-procurement systems, 33%. Sorry, the fastest growing was digital difficulty growing revenue from existing customers at 44%, 11%, too much time managing, rekeying, reprocessing POs and invoice, and then also 11% waiting too long to get payment from customers. So despite the fact that we had one kind of overall sharing uh, 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 problem here, it's consistent that there are some challenges that uh, B2B buyers and sellers are looking at across the board in, in, uh, in uh, 2023. So I find those kind of been interesting, but I wanna kind of focus back on something that, that Jamie kind of brought up here, which is, Jamie, you went through quite a bit of detail, and let's go back to our, our cameras here if we could. You went through quite a bit of detail, uh, Jamie, talking about that case study, that, that 750 and percent of uh, ROI. But you know, some folks out there might See, say that's I I'm still not quite seeing that so could you reiterate a why that customer saw that big an ROI and over what time just 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 a quick recap if you would then I got a follow-up question for that sure um, and I agree I agree with those of you out there that say 750 is too high and it's as a consultant I tend to like numbers <laughs> that are much more conservative um, but when we went through line by line with that customer um, the numbers add up, the math was real, right? They saw a significant improvement in growing their existing base by having that punch out capability. It was over almost, you know, the numbers came out to 780,000, but they had over a couple million dollars. They had a couple million dollars worth of new revenue from having those punch out capabilities. And they also saw significant time savings in managing their purchase orders and invoices. So, when you do the math and you add up all of that benefit and you subtract out what they're paying for punch out and invoice and purchase order, what they're paying for trade centric, when you do the math, you take all your benefits, you subtract out what they're paying, 
and then you divide by their paying, like if you want to actually get the ROI number, it came out to 750%. So again, um, when you dig deep, the math actually worked out that way. All right. I've got one follow-up on this question for both Tom and for and for Jamie. So Tom, you showed some resources there, some excellent resources there just not too long ago, but uh, what are some best practices that you would recommend for an organization to determine what they see as the best ROI fit for them when it comes to punch out an e-procurement? I mean, one size fits all, or how do you measure what ROI would be for an organization that's this looking uh, maybe for the first time on our webinar here today. What do you think? So that's a great question, Mark. Um, and you're right. One size does not fit all. It really depends on the business, the customers that you're uh, both trading with and, and supporting today, and then also those that you're looking to um, support going forward and depending on the industry. And then also kind of what your invoice volume and PO volume looks like. So one of the things that um, is important is we, we have a, a really a methodology really given to us by Jamie and Hobson to be able to take inputs through a discovery set of questions and calls with a supplier and put those inputs into our calculator and then spit out and, and deliver a custom analysis that is really fit to a very specific situation by industry, by size of supplier, by size of their customers, volume of POs and invoices, et cetera. So not one size fits all. It's all done according to what the specific situation is. So and Jamie, to add on to, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to add on to Tom's point. The the assumptions in the calculator obviously can be changed based on that, cus yeah. that customer, as well as which benefits. We talked about six benefits today. Not all six benefits are going to be applicable to every customer. So again, some of those can be um, turned off if they're not applicable. Yeah, you know, traditionally when this was maybe a, a not so understood uh, digital sales channel for, you know, for, for B2B organizations, this may have been the realm of say the supply chain manager, the purchasing manager, the procurement director at whatever the company might be. My question to both of you though is, is if you look at the ROI, that could be some certain benefits across the organization, which I think Jamie just pointed out, and the fact that it is unique for each organization, my question is, who has to measure and be impacted by the ROI? I mean, does the CFO have to be involved with, with the ROI uh, process here? Does the CEO have to be involved with the process here? Or is this primarily uh, something that's, that, that's for the su supply chain, procurement folks, and, and that's kind of where the buck stops. So when you look at organizational ROI, who looks at it, who appreciates it, who wants to know about it? That's, that's what I'm really asking here. Jane, what do you think? Um, I think, I mean, ultimately it's the CFO who's going to sign off on the contract. So the ROI really presents at a high level, you know, the return on investment, the payback period, the monthly cost of waiting. We have those metrics to to show what the ultimate, in, how impactful the ultimate investment will be. That being said, Tom, we can talk about when you're going through this business case analysis, you're not going to go through it with the CFO. So I'll turn it over to Tom to talk about who really will go through this. Yeah, so a lot of the folks that we work with, uh, and I helped recruit our customers to this conversation, was not involved in the conversations Jimmy had, but as I went through and, and was recruiting customers to participate along with a number of other folks at TradeCentric, we talked to a variety of people in different roles, all on the supplier side, head of e-commerce, somebody who's a lieutenant in e-commerce, um, somebody who is from the IT side of the world who was thinking about how they continue to grow this. And many of them told us that they had worked on and or were working on their own business case analyses to try and get more investment in this area, um, but didn't have a methodology. So they're very pleased to take part in this study because it gave them a framework to work with. But ultimately, you're right, Mark, it really is whoever has the cost control and the, and the spend control, I mean, we're, we're coming to the end of 22 and into 23, it's budget setting time or it has been budget setting time for many folks. The question is, okay, how much am I gonna invest in whatever and what's my ROI gonna be over what period of time? And it's always gonna end up rolling up to a CFO or somebody in FP&A. And since I'm kind of a geek for this stuff, it's what we do for a living at DC 360, I love these kind of numbers. And so once again, I point out that 
what makes the trade centric data that and the customers you talk to, Jamie, so unique here is that this is like the one, this is like the one company I think that we cover where pretty much all I mean, the the vast majority of this channel goes through one pipeline. That is such a unique view. So can we delve into just a little bit more about uh, about you know the the folks you talked to and what they were like here? So for instance, how many folks did you talk to? Uh, what was the shape and size of the customers or even industries for the study? And finally, I love to kind of pile on here. What were the demographics, firmographics, and can you tell us what they were? In other words, who took the survey and who took to talk to you for this? What, what, what do they look like? Sure, and I think Tom um, addressed this a little bit. Um, there was over a dozen customers in all different industries, right? So large, small, regional, national, um, and different um, roles within that organization. Some who were on the boots on the ground actually doing the purchase order management and the invoice matching, others who had a really good sense of the revenue implications and more of a high level that they were able to, to grow their revenue. Um, and what this does is it gives us a very broad range of feedback. Um, and what's nice is that even though it's a broad range of, of titles and roles and industries, the messaging was all the same, right? It was consistently, um, we heard consistently about these six benefits that each of them was able to quantify, to provide us you know, pre and post implementation numbers. Um, so that's um, what gives us this richness of, of support and credibility. Tom, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I agree with Jamie. It was a very broad cross-section of types of companies. Um, I wouldn't characterize many of them as small. I would call most mid-market up to very large, very large enterprises. Um, but it's a good cross-section. So it's not, and I think to your question, Mark, earlier, is this is only applicable to, let's say, middle market suppliers or distributors. No, we had a, we had a good cross-section of folks from life sciences and pharma of all different sizes and shapes, and also some levels of geography in terms of Europe as well as the US. So, and in terms of different role types, of course, with larger enterprises, you've got more middle management, and larger middle size, mid-market size companies, you have uh, higher title types, but it was a very good cross-section of folks. And what I think was, was what was gratifying for us to talk to Jamie was how consistent, as she said, all the feedback was across the different types of organizations, different types of people. And this next question is for both of you, but let's start with, uh, with, with Tom here. A few slides back, you talked about the ROI calculator. And for something for this type of uh, 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 digital sales channel, that's kind of interesting here. So uh, when you talk about, let's walk through, what does this calculator let you do and i assume the calculator jane was used in, in your in your some of your case study work here so what does that calculator allow you to do uh going forward if you choose to kind of kind of use it so let's let's talk about that just a little bit here what's the color of that thing so well, I'll, I'll start and then i'll kick it to jamie for some of the specifics so we will go through a guided discovery process asking about the types of customers that you have today the sizes of them um who could be in scope the amount of revenue the amount of um, invoice volume you send them or PO volume you get you get from them. And then also inputs, we do find customers, many of them, and especially in very large organizations that are have been doing this for years, are doing these things, some of these things themselves. Then if you're doing it yourselves and you're trying to grow that portfolio of punch out integrations, what's the cost of that? And then down to a very detailed level about, okay, what's the IT cost uh, of your folks? And what's it cost to sort of maintain or implement and then maintain these connections? Because we do this for a living. There's there's definitely that cost upfront and then ongoing. So there's a variety of different inputs that we go through in terms of the conversation and, and dialogue with a customer or prospect, and then customize the calculator and the inputs to the specific situation. So Jamie, I don't know if you've got a couple other things to add to that. Um, no, you really, you really touched upon it. The only thing I would add is that the whole process is pretty quick and easy to do. Yeah. Um, it's a web-based um, calculator, so you can do a sh screen share. The whole process probably takes under an hour. Um, you work directly with the trade-centric salesperson to customize the case based on you know, your own specific examples. 
Um, and then right then and there, you can get a report um, which highlights what the ROI, the, the, the magnitude of the benefit. We're not um, you know, going to say you're going to absolutely have a 302 ROI, but it illustrates the, the magnitude of the potential benefits of working with TradeCentric, all based on what previous customers have already seen. And my next question here is, as we, we're covering a lot of ground here, a lot, a lot of good information, but I think it's important to kind of just maybe kind of recap some key highlights here. So for instance, we talked about this being a, a growing a growing channel, it's becoming much more mainstream. We talked about what this is and how it works, but you know, I think the key takeaway here from Tom and Jamie is that this stuff is not rocket science, it's applicable technology that's going to deliver some serious ROI for an organization of any size. But let's recap, Jamie and Tom, once again, what are those prints mean? Yeah, I know it varies from, from org, org to org here, but let's reiterate, what kind of ROI, once again, can you expect if you choose to go down this route and put this channel in or expand the use of it? Um, Jamie, why don't you start? <laughs> well, we hate to give you a <laughs> hate to guarantee a certain ROI, right? Again, this is no, my I mean, what, some, just, some just expectations. Yes. What yes. do you look for, in other words? Some best some benchmarks. So some benchmarks based on the customers that we talked to and the data and putting in their numbers into this calculator, we found on average customers saw about a hundred to three hundred percent ROI, right? So really substantial ROIs. Um, again, every situation is different. There are certain benefits that are going to be applicable, certain assumptions that you may change, but we have seen consistently that um, there's typically over 100% ROI for any customer that we've talked to. And Tom, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I say, and there's two sides to that, as Jamie described. It's really the operational efficiencies that you gain from not doing this yourself, and then also the, the other operational efficiencies you gain in dealing with invoices and POs, et cetera. And then on the other side, and this is also extremely important, like revenue growth from existing customers that are looking for this capability and expecting this capability. Also the ability to address new customers. This is e-procurement is very heavily penetrated in certain um, industry segments, for instance, college, university, et cetera. So there's areas where um, that has become the predominant way that people are um, sort of managing their procurement processes. So it opens up new market segments that you may not be able to address without it. So there's those, those two sides of the um, equation, if you will, about trying to drive uh, ROI. All right. Hey, let's stick with you, Tom. Uh, what if we don't expect to expand our business into new customers and our markets? How will this affect the overall ROI? So that's a great question. Um, it'll obviously go down, but as Jamie mentioned, we have run those experiments where it says, okay, I'm not going to expand into new markets. I'm only gonna use this as my existing customer base. And typically we do see significant increases in purchase volume from those suppliers who can respond. And so, and so again, there's both revenue growth impact on existing customers, which should be substantial, as well as operational efficiencies um, I will mention also that um, there are operational efficiencies to be gained by buyers as well, not just from punch out, but then also from purchase order and invoice automation. Um, one of the biggest pain points that we hear about from the buyer side of our ecosystem is PO and invoice matching, which is sort of a Sarbanes-Oxley and financial controls requirement. Well, doing this, and you don't have to do it with us, just doing it in general increases the um, overall likelihood of automated PO and invoice matching substantially, and those suppliers that can help customers do that, you know, I would want to do more business with them as well, right? So that also can drive growth. Jamie, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think Tom really hit it. Um, the, the idea that there are these six benefits that we're able to quantify. Um, there's additional benefits that you we're not we just didn't quantify but we're also very strategic and tom and his team can speak to those um, during this analysis and again not all six benefits are going to be applicable but even if you turn a few of them off we still found that there is a substantial roi to be had and this is our final question because it's been a fascinating hour but we're kind of coming up on the uh on our our our, our closing question here but 
I want to kind of leave with a little foreshadowing. So, Tom, at the start, we mentioned that next year, I mean, by our calculations, but it's basically kind of based on, you know, your data, kind of that pipeline there, a trillion dollar market. That's with a T. So why do you think that over time, over fast forward time, e-procurement and punch out have become not just a minor channel, but a major mainstream way that companies are doing business today digitally? What changed facilitated that, do you think? It's really sort of the, the secular growth trends of both B2B e-commerce investment, more and more sophisticated suppliers, as well as the secular growth trend of um, buyers trying to get more efficiency in their organization with e-procurement investment and the ability to sort of connect those two things together to both automate the purchase process and make it simpler for both sides, as well as then the things that happen like PO and invoice around that purchase process. It's just a natural byproduct of how both seller behavior as well as buyer behavior has changed over the last decade. And, and if anything, I think probably was accelerated by the pandemic. All right, Jamie, what do you think? We're gonna say, we're gonna say the last word for you here. So why do you think that this is accelerating and becoming mainstream? Because frankly, it is. Um, I mean, Tom's the industry expert over here. I can just say that from the customers that I spoke to, it was just so much easier to, to be able to have this integrated e-commerce solution that um, it was like a no brainer. You know, Once they started doing the integrations, they realized how, how much easier it was for the buyers and the suppliers to be integrated and to just exponentially grow that revenue um, in a very organic way. And sorry, one last takeaway, takeaway for you, Jamie. In the case study where the ROI was at 750%, uh, when you talk to the customer, what did they think about going forward? They thought they could match that. They want more of it. What was the perspective kind of going forward? Or did, did, did you have a chance to address that with them? Sure. I mean, they, they felt validated, right? They, they were yeah. able to say, hey, I knew that this was a good decision to invest with TradeCentric. Um, it would help them in the future if they ever had to go through contract negotiations internally to justify the spend with TradeCentric. Um, you know, it basically, they, it, it said, yes, we know that we're getting these benefits and now we've put a dollar value on it. So it was um, really um, enlightening for them. All right. Well, with that, Tom Roberts and Jamie Axford, we thank you so much for your, uh, you know, for your time and thoughts today. So takeaway is e-procurement, a lot more coming online. So uh, Jamie and Tom, thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone for their presentations and all of you spending an hour with us. We hope you found the content worthwhile. After we sign off here, you'll see a short survey pop up on your screen. If you can take a few moments to fill out the survey with our feedback, we'd appreciate it because it helps us guide the development of future webinars, including for this all important channel of e-commerce. So with that, uh, we'd like to kind of wish you a good day and thank you for tuning in. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Thanks Mark, thanks, thanks Jamie.